Okay, so um, following on from last week, um, we're gradually moving towards the sort of the more social and linguistic aspects of uh, organization. And I know that John had some questions about the relationship between mathematics and language. Um, I've got some questions about the relationship of the nature of language and whether language is nil potent. I know I asked you that question a couple of weeks ago, Peter, and you smiled about it. So I, I think that's, that's particularly interesting. I've actually just been giving a presentation about music and some of the analysis I've been doing in music. I must say, I'm pretty convinced that music could well be nil potent in the way that it operates. So we've got these different forms of communication and maybe there's an opportunity to explore their structure and nature and the extent to which they may be homologous or related to the cellular structures, the, the cellular processes that John's been discussing. But, but John, I, I wonder if I could turn to you first, um, because you also had a question about um, mathematics as a language. Yeah, I emailed you this morning. I just had this sort of uh, burst of thought that um, to, uh, to ask whether mathematics is, langu is a language. Uh, I know certainly that universities accept computer language as being a language, but that may just be semantic. I do think that mathematics is language. And what I said to you was that I thought that language as we think about it conventionally is actually in the explicate, whereas perhaps mathematics is already in the implicate order uh, in Bohmian terms. Um, and then I also, uh, more uh, I'm thinking about gearing up to this thing, I was thinking about the periodicity of if it's language in that periodic table of education to the far left and mathematics to the far right. There would either be a qualitative or quantitative filling in of those spaces in between with regard to um, so, some disciplines are more qualitative, others are more quantitative. And so there would be a sort of a logic to that, but that's as far as I got with that. And I do, and I am very interested in your thoughts about music because, I mean, if I think about if poetry is the uh, transition from prose to music, mm. the question in my mind is, um, yeah, how does how does that thinking lend itself or not to the way that we're parsing this out? Yeah. yeah. But I do see a way forward to reducing all of that back to the first principles of physiology in my way of thinking, because um, at the risk of repeating myself, I was able to um, vertically integrate that physiologic process all the way through to bipedalism um, freeing of the four, four limbs, tool making and, um, and, la and language and language actually in my way of thinking that way, language being a form of tool making. Uh, and the example I used was I have a piece of um, flint and I picture the, the arrowhead in the flint and all of a sudden I'm starting to chip away at that uh, piece of rock to create that arrowhead in the same way. And again, this may be forced, but I, I do see this, the homo homology with uh, an idea in my mind and then chipping away at that. We're not so much chipping away, but actually, actually it's more synthetic in terms of subject, verb, object. Mm. And I think maybe it was um, John Williamson who was saying that, well, in other languages, that's not, a, you know, in, in Chinese, it's symbol language, but, uh, but logic, but I, I think it's the same thing. It's just a matter of the sort of the components. Which, uh, I, actually with did, us. I actually did read uh, this associate of Noam Chomsky's, uh, uh, Berwick uh, published a book on Why Only Us, which is very interesting because there is a lot of theory, language theory in there that I wasn't aware of. So, um, but I read the whole thing and I still am thinking the same way, but that's maybe because I'm not smart enough to get out of my own way. Anyway, I think um, I'm just, <laughs> just, uh, just saying, uh, John's oh, with us. I, I don't know if you... Who was that? Yeah. Um, Ms. Rich, I have a question on this. I don't understand what it means for a language to be nilpotent. Yeah. I'm just looking up the definition. Nilpotent is an algebra term. If you take something to some power, eventually it hits zero. Mm -hmm. And so if you speak long enough, you cancel everything you meant to say and there's nothing there. That is 
unlikely to be what you mean when you say language is nilpotent. What does it mean? I think for me, I think more in terms of conversation rather than language per se. So I am interested in the fact that conversations have a beginning and an end. And I'm interested in the end. And what is it? What is it? At what point do we decide that we have finished a particular conversation? Is it, is it just that we're knackered? Um, or is, it, is, it, is there something that's been achieved um, in the journey of the conversation that um, we feel that there's a sort of natural conclusion to it? It's, it's here, I'm, I'm mindful that language, well, conversation particularly, the, the word is conversare, it, it's to turn together, it's a dance. And there is a point at which the dance stops. And in that sense, it's musical for me, but then I'm, I'm, my background is in music, so I tend to think of these things in, in musical terms. But a piece of music has to stop at some point. How about the, um, the never-ending rise? You know, the, <laughs> it's the one where they, they play games with the octave, so you just keep going up and up forever. Yeah. Well, that never stops unless you arbitrarily shut it off. No. <laughs> but does it come down at all? No, that's the whole point. Mm. It's um, this is an approximation of what the of what it is. So you you, you play a chord, mm -hmm. and the chord is a mixture of several octaves. Mm -hmm. And the middle octave has the higher volume than the ones on either end. Mm -hmm. And then you move up to the next note, mm -hmm. and the next note, and the next note. And at some point, when you get about an octave higher, the, the dominant octave is dropped down. So if you're listening to pitch, it's always rising. Yes, I know what you mean. Is that a bit of an optical illusion, though? It's an oral illusion. Sure, but it also keeps on going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Andrew. I can give an instance of language being nil potent. Oh, thank you. If you look at language as a series of atoms, such as phonemes or letters, then letters uh, add up to nothing. Every letter is defined by its complement in the alphabet. I'm talking as a visual object. Uh, when you read something, you, 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 you get a meaning, but you don't learn, but you never notice anything about the font, which is invisible. The font is designed to vanish and every letter vanishes in its font. You might think letters are designed to be visual and to leap out at you. In fact, they are designed to be camouflaged amongst other letters. And that's what typographers do. That's why they share features. So a letter is like a Myron fermion that appears for a moment and then vanishes as you run your line, your eye along the line. Uh, and that's how the series of, it comes out of nothing. I can further add, when you look at a page of text, there is nothing to say about it until you begin to read it. It has no pattern uh, or no form. And if something is on the page, like a dead fly, it leaps out at you because it's as if it's a blank nothing. A dead fly leaps out at you. Because there is nothing to see. It's, it, 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 it's like a vacuum out of which these letters emerge one after the other. The fly is near potent. It's quite <laughs> <laughs> the, fly, the fly is this anti-nil potent thing, you know. It's, a, it's the letters which are camouflaged in the text and, and come out at you. Um, I have, I've written about this if you want to... And, and you gave a very good presentation on this, which is on video, which I can share with people if... if, if, no. if... But I think the same applies to musical scales and numerals and other... Uh, digital interfaces mm. where um, where you have a set of objects which occur in a, a in a sequence to give a message I, I think we should ask Peter because we're, we're sort of being very metaphorical and waving our arms around here about nil potency and perhaps Peter you can um, you can give us your opinion as to whether you think we're completely mad or whether there might be something in this I don't think you're completely mad. Just oh, thank you. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah. Well, I think what Andrew said is very interesting. Um, what I'm just saying is uh, that uh, I don't really know that I've got a lot immediately to say about this. Um, language is, uh, is something that is part of our thinking process mm. and our and so our thinking process is nilpotent in the sense that we connect with the rest of the universe when we think. And, and that's the way I look at it. So in that sense, language is you know, part of that process. Hmm. I, I noticed that um, the David Bohm film, which I sent round, I don't know if people had a chance to watch, but a week after it was released, uh, Rupert Sheldrake released a sort of, interview that he did with a friend of his uh, almost to say um hey folks they've made a film about me and um and i think there's a vast difference between rupert sheldrake and david bohm but but of course rupert sheldrake would say when you think of something it has an effect in his morphic field in the rest of the universe that makes a, a thing more thinkable somewhere else that's his whole and you kind of think oh we're, we're in crazy territory here yeah because i mean he assumes that very tiny effects can actually have big consequences, which very often they can't. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes they can, but m most of the time they can't. But they, they theoretically affect everything else, but it doesn't mean that you can uh, transmit thoughts to someone else or anything like that. So you talking now is having an effect in all of us. Yes. Um, what is there a way, what do I want to say about that? So oh, if, maybe I can ask a question here, but if it has a small effect rather than a large effect, does it does that make it nil potent? Is it a matter of scale of the effect? The whole of nature works on nil potency, but whether you, whether you think that you can get some large scale effect and call it that, uh, or whether you're talking about the, the, the structural components of something is a different thing. And um, us connecting with the rest of the universe is, is, we do connect with the rest of the universe. We connect as John Stell does, and you, you, it, it connects immediately. It's a sort of homeostasis if you want to use that, that metaphor. So, is nil potency about entropy or homostasis? Well, nil potency is this thing originally, well, where, I, where I start using the term is for a fermion, a particle, a physics particle, a fundamental particle. Fundamental particle seems to exist in such a way that it has a mirror image in the rest of the universe. So, it's a total cancellation between the particle and the universe. And th th this is how Pauli exclusion works because no other fermion can look like it. No, none other, no other one can be exactly the same. Now, how that translates up to other things is another issue. But because, because a single particle is no potent, it, it, any effect on the universe will also affect that particle and vice versa. Any effect on the particle affect the universe but it depends on what level you're talking about a particle in in my hand an electron in my hand isn't going to to, to change the, the whole structure of the universe in the ordinary sense of that what people would notice mm. I, I think um i think nil potency here we're, we're not talking about something which is very very small which goes down to something which is nothing at all yeah. We're talking about something which which has a which has a structure, which connects different parts of it together, in terms of the constraints which are put on the kind of function which this thing can have. So, if you take one of those fermions, that fermion has a solution which is oscillatory, which is an oscillating solution, which is which is a harmonic solution. And uh, th that can be the case within a nilpotent uh, system because um, the total change on what's happening is is of of, of this of, of the system is zero. So it's a system which is which is a zero change system, not a zero not not an almost not there at all system. So this isn't zero in the sense of it not being there at all. It's more zero in the sense of being 
of being um, connected uh, and unchanging in that sense. So, um, so, 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 yes, I mean, you could say that, that, that um, so if we're talking about language being nilpotent, uh, you could say that the terms of a conversation would then lead to something which came, came back in some sense full circle, came back to a completion. Now in music as well, you'll have something coming back to a completion as you go round, ra round an octave. So I guess that that could also be in that sense uh, nilpotent. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at the same time here in terms of language, which is very complex. And I hope a language will always go somewhere and produce some change. Mm -hmm. Some conversation will produce some change, some growth, some additional understanding. And I guess then you'd say that that wasn't um, nilpotent in that well, sense. Peter System, John, um, his, his um, the, 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 the local and the um, non-local no, the non -local stuff is different in that sense. So the local stuff will never completely be nilpotent. It will never completely cancel itself out. So that is where the change comes from, isn't it? Yeah, it, it never completely cancels itself out. I mean, it did, no part of it doesn't mean nothing. It means square root of nothing. It means that it can be created into nothing. It doesn't mean it is nothing. And it, it, it never does become nothing. It always changes as the other component that it's its partner changes. And that's the rest of the universe. Okay, well, isn't that just like a word in a dictionary is defined in terms of other words? It's a closed system. Yeah. A language is a closed universe where every word is defined by its complement. Um, in the same way, Harold Bloom, the critic, says the content of a poem is another poem. So all the poems form a closed system. And if you, how can I put it? You can't just write a poem. You have to write a poem so that it, re so it respects all the other poems that have gone before, unless you're an idiot. <laughs> in this closed system, you have a balance between the marked thing, that's the poem, and the unmarked thing, which is the rest of poetry. But if that's the case, I mean, if, we, if we're just going in circles when we read prose or poetry, is that just feeding into uh, Trevor's uh, deceptive practice? Are we just deceiving ourselves into actually making, you know, some sort of, other than like the Magna Carta or the Constitution or some inflammatory uh, mind comp which does you know make for change in society but those are few and far between but otherwise is it just busy work we're just going in circles and well, that's yes, actually it is. consistent what? i think a lot of literature as in a lot of living things is just busy work it's just one damn insect after another but occasionally except, go on but except that my experience in uh, rereading classic uh, literature or uh, the example I, I i love is you know the the play our town uh, Thornton Wilder. You know, as you see it ac across your own life cycle, you change <laughs> and you recognize that the work is yeah. changing with you. So yes. in that sense, it's very dynamic, but it's not the, you know, it's not that uh, synchronic process, it's the diachronic process that really is Absolutely. a dynamic process. Yeah, but uh, that's particularly true in music. Um, so um, if you play a uh, Beethoven sonata or whatever it might be. I, and personally, I'm very aware that I'm doing something that has been repeated um, across well, a couple of hundred years or so. And it's, it's, it's as if the language is there. Yes, it's, some, it's something that goes around in circles, but it has this sort of coherence to it. Its circular structure has a, something coherent to it, which makes it survive and exist across generations, across time. But it's, it's the sort of, the, it's almost a way of, it gives you a, um, what's, I don't know what it is. It's, it's like a long distance telescope into history. Mm -hmm. It's biological history. Yeah, I remember attending the uh, opening season of uh, Boston Symphony years ago, and they were playing Beethoven's Consecration of the House, and I'm reading the liner notes, and they're saying, you know, when this was first played, there were basically no ambient noise out back, you know, other than the clopping, of, you know, of some horse going by. You know, that was so different from the experience I was having, you know, in, in you know, contemporary Boston. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you have that universality, but there's also that immediacy of it too. There's like this 
um, reverberation be, uh, across space time. Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, yes, definitely. And it's it's as if you, um, it's when when you actually play it, you and it's it's hard. It's hard, it's difficult to do. It's you you have to train yourself. You have to you have to go through a sort of pedagogy with your cells to make them do the things that need to be done and you know that everybody who's attempted this thing before you has had to go through exactly the same thing because basically they were the same and that that there's something powerful in that yeah i agree let me think it's almost as if we perform language we we think of it as a tool but Maybe we perform it. Maybe I don't know. Can I go back to something that John and, and, and Andrew were saying, which was very interesting, coming back to Bohm as well, and the implicate, implicate and explicate order. And I think it was John who said something along the lines of maybe language is already uh, in the implicate regime. Mm. Maybe mathematics is originally in the implicate regime, I think, but he was talking right. about mathematics as a language. Perhaps language too is also already in the implicate regime. As one's using it for thinking, it kind of, in very often, I don't know if this is other people's experience of thinking as well, but for me, the language kind of vanishes in, in thinking and thinking becomes something which is language. Language is there, it's part of thinking. It's part of the verbalization is what's coming out right at the moment of what I'm trying to think. But the actual thinking process is, 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 um, pre is uh, using language but language there is a medium like andrew was saying which is kind of invisible in that process yes we talk so about the transparency of language yes yes language is designed to be transparent uh -huh. that's what this guy berwick is saying in uh, this book about you know the evolution of language so, so it's, really, it's, it's the medium for, for thinking and I, I guess i mean i would throw out the idea that maybe the language is acting as a matrix for connecting our consciousness with the consciousness of the cosmos. And that would, that would put it firmly in the realm of the implicate order then in terms of Bohm's thinking. It's, trans, it's transcendent. I, th I would submit it's, tran it's transcendent. It's not, the math is already there. I think the, the language gets you, moves you in that direction towards the implicate with all the respect. But, but if I say, for example, something simple like the word apple or grape, then, then I'm talking about something which, is expl which can be explicate. Well, here's an explicate grape. Right. So, um, so, 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 but, but in terms of me thinking that, is that not implicate? Depends upon how far you, your mind follows that. that yeah. image, right? Yes. Yes. It only remains right? in the you context of the sphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I said, if you eat the grape, does that make it nil potent? <laughs> Here's another grape. <laughs> <laughs> what, what if you wrote a poem about the grape? <laughs> I'd, ha I'd have to be quite a bit better at English than I am at the moment to, to, <laughs> to achieve that one. But, but you know, I, I think we should be thinking about scientific outputs of this discussion group and maybe some poetry about inanimate objects would be a good place to start. <laughs> It's about my level, I think, there, if we try to do that in terms of that. Yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but, um, but, but also mathematics as a, as, a, as a language, if we're talking about mathematics, and we can talk about, John was just talking about um, mathematics being, being the structure of thinking, but sorry, language being the structure of thinking. But I, I think it's not the structure, but a structure of thinking. And, and that mathematics is perhaps you can say mathematics is another language, but again, it's a structure of thinking and it's a structured way of thinking which we structure. So, um, and thinking about whether mathematics is implicate or explicate. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, when you start inventing a new mathematics, you have no idea what's gonna come out when you, when, you, when you go through the process of getting to the point where you have come round and you've understood what that mathematics can tell you. Within a within a with, within a framework in which it's it's bounded within its own logical framework, so it certainly starts out being implicate and perhaps ends up being explicate when uh, when results come out of it. And perhaps language is the same thing that it starts in the implicate regime and ends up in the explicate when when a concrete thing comes out of it. 
So I'm thinking, you know, the experiment that Bohm describes in uh, wholeness and the implicate order is with this stretchable matrix and he puts two India ink dots on it in close proximity and then he stretches the matrix and the dots disappear. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my understanding of what that meant was that that's the transition from the explicate to the implicate. It's the abstraction. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense, math and, and language both are, can be, both are, can be abstractions or they can mm -hmm. be tangible or both, right? Yeah. Isn't there something powerful in the maths though, that um, it, it, it may be part of the implicate order, but it can also describe what that implicate order might be. So Peter, for example, it, it may be nilpotent, but it can, it can actually describe at a deeper level what nilpotency is because it can produce nothing. If you, if you use Peter's techniques, you, you produce nothing and it's, a, it's magical. Um, but it, if you were then play with the mathematics and see you, you've got a lot of physics things to think about and you put the mathematics next to it, it starts explaining the physics. Yeah. So, you know, that's something very odd about it. Um, but it is a language, language, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, when you write a piece, do you actually consciously write each word? Because I don't think I do. No. No, I, I don't think I do at all. It, it comes out of me. And when I look over it, I think, oh, yeah, you know, right. I don't always, you know, work out exactly what I'm going to say at all. I yeah, it's almost, it's almost like the mathematics is talking back to you in a sense mm -hmm. when you do it, isn't it? As though you're almost having a conversation with the maths. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 right. Prose and, and do mathematics seems to be pretty similar. It's all kind of intuitive and it, it, uh, it, it comes out in its own order. I've just been looking at a passage in um, Gregory Bateson's work um, where he describes, he's talking about information theory and he's describing the um, process of, on the one hand, dealing with the problem of spelling. So dealing with the, the, the information entropy of choosing the right letters to spell a word, but then saying, I have a higher level selection process to go through where I'm trying to choose the appropriate word. And, and his argument is that actually, if I have the higher level selection process to choose the appropriate word, it must entail the fact that I've already solved or already got some idea of solving the lower level entropy problem of, of how to spell the word. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating, because I mean, everything in Bateson is about levels and recursion. And um, I, I, think, I think, Peter, what you just said is, is of, of the same, of the same um, the same kind of issue really mm. very very likely yes but uh, <clears throat> this may not but, make any sense but as a dyslexic i must say the spelling always uh is, is a very different process than the finding of the word <clears throat> it, i i can't spell anything and i have to discover mm. how to spell it long after the word has shown up that's interesting so i wonder if um i wonder what bateson would say to that he would say, yeah, okay, so that's, that's maybe that reveals something about the selection processes that are particular to dys dyslexia, perhaps. And when I read, I don't see the letters. Exactly. Yeah. Letters are designed to vanish, but if you, that supposes a certain level of acuity and perception. And if you see things differently, if you're very observant, if you have very good vision, you will not be able to read very well. Uh, so the reason that we can read and say a gorilla can't is not just a matter of the, um, it's in part, they, they, they could see and perceive better than us, I would guess. We have to lower our perception in order to make letters vanish, in order to make uh, the word appear. Yeah. So dyslexia, I would guess, is an activism. I was talking to another uh, friend of mine whose son is dyslexic, as is he, and he was pointing out that it took him a while to understand how his, what his son was saying, how it related to what he was thinking. And basically he jumps and leaves big chunks out. And once you realize, like getting across the stream, you don't have to step on every stone, you can get across, but other people who think you have to step on, yeah, you know, it's a communication problem. So I think that that may, 
you know, I, I have a horrible problem um, explaining new things, things that are new to me, to other people, because I, uh, you know, the way my brain works or doesn't work is it, it, it jumps and doesn't, just like the, it reads, <laughs> it doesn't pay much attention to the, the things it skips over. Mm. And they're there. Yeah. <laughs> they're part of it uh, somehow, but you can go, I can go back and find them like I can the letters, but that's not the way it's, it's occurring to me. Is this bringing some discreteness then in, in, into your thinking as opposed to continuous? Is this, does this chip, does this feather into the uh, discussion we have been having also about the discrete and continuous? I don't know. It just seems more poetic, more like a flow, like uh, you, you have to go back almost like uh, the, the way I understand Einstein's approach. I'm, I'm not making any comparison, believe me, but it seemed like he would get a feeling for uh, a discontinuity the, in the way things were explained and go, that's not right. And then he would figure it out and work out the math over 20 or 30 years. It, it's, it has a little bit of that flavor. Um, you know, because you you know, if you skip parts, you're never certain. You have to go back and check, right? But if you if you're checking as you're going, you're not getting very far. I don't know. Well, Later. I don't know if I'm weird, but I think you can. I can bring that on what you just described, Mark, on to my, for myself. Because if I if I just read um, freely, it's different from if I think about each word as I'm going along. It's two different. They're two different experiences. So yes. maybe that's recapitulating what you're talking about. I have, a, I have a couple of questions. Are, are we you, uh, reducing uh, language to letters? I mean, it seems that we're not doing that right now. Um, I'm not sure, but that makes it somehow inanimate. And then yes. you were saying that math, the conversation with them. Sorry. I would suggest and, it's ideas, not letters or words. Quite. Because you can always paraphrase something and the paraphrase of a paraphrase is a paraphrase. You can go on and on. So, and if I say, what was that book about? It's like the Woody Allen joke. He said he read um, War and Peace. It was about some Russians, you know, um, but that doesn't mean you haven't read it. But the reason I'm so, asking is because the letters were given as an example of nil potency of language. So I'm yeah. just making that point. And the other question, the other thing that, that seems that that, uh, that I have is uh, what so, some someone said you're having a conversation with the mass and it's as though it's talking back to you. Well, that that's not. Um, I don't see nil potency there. I'm not sure, but there's something that is very much alive rather than these so-called dead letters. So it's just questions and looking for consistency here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a question as people have been talking because there's this question about language being a tool, and that's um, John. That's very much what you, you've been um, you've been thinking as well. That language is a tool, and I suppose the question is then: Well, what does the tool do? And tools I, vanish. Sorry. Tools vanish. Tools vanish, or is the is the is the tool of language is its is its function to make the world disappear because we've spent a lot of time talking about how language can jump over things or or make things um make things simpler in some ways or more tractable but a lot of the complexity of perception disappears when we are able to articulate it in language so maybe language is doing a disappearing act on the world Absolutely. It's, it's taking the verb out of, it's making things out of processes. It's Is that the same thing, Mark, do you think? Well, I think it's related to what you're saying. Um, yeah, it, it, language, in my, my, my understanding of, of language is that it makes things tracti tractable, usable. You can move them around. Once you have a word, you can set it over there, you can set it over there, but it's lost almost all of its life. Yes. Okay. I definitely agree with that. So this is um, so I I kind of it, it might be worth talking about Maturana. Uh, Mark, I was going to ask you about this because you mentioned it um, before the last session. 
Um, I think, I mean, I, I personally have some issues with Maturana because I feel that he doesn't have the depth which we potentially might have if we start to seriously talk about nil potency. But, but I think it would be worth just sort of thinking about what Maturana's argument was, is, because he's still around, isn't he? Oh, I don't think so. Varela is, but I don't think... He definitely, no, Varela's dead. Maturana's no, Varela died, dead. yeah, yeah. Definitely well, alive. I think he's 91 or 92. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Going. But can I just so is are we saying that language is just a form of abstraction? Is that why reality disappears because we're abstracting? Well, it, it define abstraction because uh, to me that's a slightly confusing word, which is kind of ironic. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I, if by abstraction you mean uh, what I was saying is that you take only a part and you leave the rest. If that's what you mean, like, definitely it's an abstraction. If you mean that somehow it's le not real, whatever that means, I, I, I don't think it's gotten rid of all reality. It's just gotten rid of all the, the moving reality, all the possibilities. Right. I think that's well, a very interesting realm. Can, can I just ask everybody to try and do something for a, a, a <laughs> moment or two? Try and imagine you're just as intelligent as you are, but you have no language and think about the world without language, what would the world without language look like to an equally intelligent creature, a dolphin or something that has no, ha, is equally smart, but has no language. Can, can think about that. What is, it's, it's, like the, it's like the Monty Python, you know, what did the Romans do for us? Yeah. Uh, what does language do for us here? Imagine, imagine language less. Does that mean one can't think? I think not. But how would that language look without, how would that thinking process look without language for each one of us? I think it goes back to what I was positing earlier about, it's, it's what you're working with are ideas and, and ideas are, as somebody said, pre-linguistic. Yeah, yeah, you go look for the word once the idea, the sensation has shown up. And I think a dolphin, my guess would be dolphins uh, have visual and tactile ideas. And they have a language of sorts or a communication code. But I think ideas are pre-linguistic, yeah. And I think it's about intuition and consciousness rather than cognitive processes up in the head. So what I was saying last week, and I'll repeat, is that I think that we are unique in that, yeah, a dolphin can have an idea, but it's only going to be synchronic. I don't think that they have the facility to do what we do, and that is to also consider the diachronic implications, the history of whatever it is that you're dealing with, which is yeah. really you know, critical in terms of the difference between us and, and other species. Well, they have history in their cells though, don't they? Wow. Oh, sure. But I don't think they can bring it to consciousness. We, I, I really think That's we, the we have the capacity to, to be able to think of the past, present, and future simultaneously. I don't think that's I, I, necessarily so. I would, I would say. Dog. If, if you're thinking, there's this saying, an elephant never forgets, for example, elephants are fairly <laughs> intelligent creatures. They have an, a, a, temporal, a temporal sense. They know about past, present, and future. And if you think about dolphins, I mean, they, they, they see with sound. So you can imagine them having a word for a shape. So uh, being, able to, being able to produce a sound which represents perhaps a part of what they see when they see, when they see, um, Hmm. They see a when they see a grape. So if they see a grape, they can say, you know, what's the shape of that grapeness? And and I, I don't see why they shouldn't be able to remember and pass things on if they're sufficiently intelligent. It doesn't need to be a language. It could be pictures, for example. We could if 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 one could say a picture. If I could say grape or apple or shape or watch, if I could actually say that, then uh, then and remember it as a shape, then one could think in those shapes, surely. Especially if you say Apple Watch. Why has no one thought of that before? <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, that would be a Chinese method, wouldn't it? I wonder if the Chinese <laughs> sign for it is, is, is Apple Watch. In... Surrealist painting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Huge meaning in that. Yeah, good man. Pictures is a language of sorts, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. But I think like when, when people talk about, you know, being under extreme stress and your life passes before you, 
I think that that's a human uh, characteristic that I, I don't think other organisms experience. They just fight, fight or fight, whereas we problem solve as well. And I think prob in being able to problem solve as an alternative to fight or flight, that's an abstraction. And I think that's different from other organisms. But John, do you think you're being, uh, I mean, I don't want to um, say this, but uh, we worry a lot about anthropocentrism. And do you think it's anthropocentric to say this? You know, we probably will. No, I, I was about to say we'll never know. But I do. I think we have the capacity to determine this if we were to understand uh, how to do an MRI on a dolphin's brain. Um, and be able to visualize how they problem solve the same way that we do. But if, until we understand in our own being, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Maybe it is a projection of my own. But I guess, you know, the fact that the head structure evolved and there was huge selection pressure for that, mm. I think, and, the, and that what, now you have the merging of language and tool making as one and the same process, but in different um, modalities and that that as I've suggested gives rise to civilization because once you have written language that that's the capacity to transfer information from one generation to the next that doesn't exist in any other species no. so there is a hierarchical organization there I think and so yes I I'm vulnerable to being I try not to be anthropocentric desperately but maybe I'm being can't help ourselves John, what do you think that the relationship is between consciousness and language? Oh, I think language is an expression of consciousness. It's a, it's a, it's the material expression of consciousness. This is the hard problem. Or, or lack of consciousness sometimes. Oh, so the, you know, Ch Chalmers hard qu uh, problem. Uh, I said many iterations ago in the, in the Zoom that I think that what it, that is, you know, the example was you whack your thumb with a hammer and you see red. I think that that's because our physiology emanates all the way from the unicellular state and first principles physiology, and that we remember that. When we do that, when we, when we injure ourselves, we remember probably bleeding in association with harming ourselves, and it's an atavistic trait that comes back to the, to the fore. Yeah, that's what I think Chalmers was talking about. Mm. Do you think, John, that there is, um, because obviously, as I'm making my utterances now, I'm also uh, engaging my physiology in all sorts of ways, and that physiology is producing all sorts of byproducts. And they're not separable from the words that I'm speaking, are they? No, no, it's, it's, it's a so the whole thing has to be taken in together. Correct. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to say was that, so the fine motor control and language are ha housed in the area of Broca in the cerebrum. It's only us and, and other primates that have that structure. And in all probability, the difference between us. So in that book, that Berwick book, he says that there is very close, um, homology between a chimpanzee's brain and a human brain. There's a very small difference in structure. And he suggests that there's some growth factor that's missing. I think I found it in the literature. It's FOXP2, which has been claimed to be the gene for language. FOXP2 also in a knockout experiment was shown to affect bone formation. So that, and they, and the authors were suggesting that this is necessary for bi bipedalism. So you have a genetic linkage yeah. between language, bipedalism, and uh, the vertical integration of all that as you know as i was just talking about but mark you're right i mean yeah I, that's what i'm trying to say is that the physiology is an integrated vertical integration yeah uh yeah and that's why we don't think about all of the intermediate steps unless there's some as i've said i you know in having a near-death experience i re i came to that realization because i was in the moment i was nowhere i was is i was in limbo it was black and white I had no fear uh, and, and I just was totally conscious. So uh, my guess is that that, and, and you know, that's people have described these near death experiences or out of body experiences. They're the way that the neuroendocrine system allows for that wave collapse and coherence that we see in physics. I think it's the same thing. Mark. Yeah, I, yeah, I keep going, I mean, I'm way back 10 minutes ago, but uh, I'm just thinking about letters and words and, uh, sentences and ideas as, as Spencer Brown's mark 
and then you ask yourself, uh, what are what is the utility of marks in those different um, hierarchies or ca you know <clears throat> I think they are hierarchies so uh, you know the the distinction between the background and the and the mark the foreground it makes a lot of difference whether you're focused on words letters or words or ideas or sets of ideas and and so and I I don't. I don't claim to even have any idea what you guys are talking about with Milpot. And when I go read it, I, I don't even, I can't even, I'm not smart enough to know what the square root of something equaling zero even means. It's the unmarked space. <laughs> okay. All right. But I, I think that there's something, I think the world appears in the mark. I mean, I think that Spencer Brown's idea in math is the, that's where everything comes from. And then you get to ask yourself the, the interesting question is what kind of marks are you making? You know, what kind of marks are appealing to you and, and with what consequence? And, and that probably is just goofy, but there it is. Mm. Mm. Andrew? No, I was, I, could I point out that the alphabet, which is transparent, a set of letters you can't see except one at a time. What you are seeing is pure difference. Um, so there isn't anything there and the alphabet is incredibly when you look at it it's unbelievably complicated a font it takes three years to design a font and they are architectural they are they match uh, movements in art they contain there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a there's something written by Victor Hugo where he points out all the weird things you can find in the alphabet it's as if it's a compendium of all civilization distilled into these symbols um, and they are architectural which I still find absolutely unbelievable that, that this craft of making buildings appears in the way we communicate. Yeah. Isn't that odd? Well, if... But also there's this, this, this the dimension that I think is, is so interesting which goes it, it is the vertical dimension which goes from the language to the cells and potentially also to physics that that that's the thing that i don't think in all the uh amount of stuff that's been written about language people haven't gone there and i really think we should yeah i i, I agree but I'm, I'm thinking that we could have this conversation in all of this conversation nobody's written down a letter we haven't needed it no. And, and we didn't have letters. Uh, we had language before we had letters. People were communicating verbally before they had any means of writing it down. Oh. One another. Well, not quite, because the Bible begins with writing. Oh, the Bible itself is written. Yes, I'm, I'm not saying that. No, but, I'm but, saying... But, but the Jews as a nation, as the beginning of Yahweh, begins with writing. But those stories yeah. were told verbally before they were written. Yes, there was a verbal tradition and a sung tradition as well. Mm. So, so e even in fairly recent history, in, in, in Scotland, for example, everybody, nearly everybody couldn't write. And yet there, there are traditions, there are, there are member traditions which were sung or which were told in poetry or which were told verbally. Yeah. But, but there's also, that, that's one dimension. But another dimension is one can devise, and indeed it has been devised, if we're talking about the kind of language we use at the moment, it's a symbolic system for speech. It's a way of writing down spoken word. Our English language is, 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 is a cipher for speech. Yes. But, but, it's, but, um, but Chinese writing is not like that, for example. Chinese writing is not a cipher for speech. They have, a, they have a spoken language. They have many spoken languages, hundreds of spoken languages, different ones, which all use the same writing system. And the writing system there is, is symbolic and perfectly good for transmitting ideas from generation to generation without the kind of lang written language. I'm distinguishing here between spoken language, written language, and symbolic language. Symbolic language, even if we couldn't talk, if we couldn't speak at all, if we could only draw or picture things, would work for a creature that could not simply vocalize, that couldn't make the complex vocalizations that we have, but could write an octopus or something, I don't know, some tentacle monster, can't speak but can draw. They can produce a written language, which is a language of symbols, which is perfectly good for transmitting information, surely, without having to use the language which we're using. That language is something we've made up. 
It's just a made up system to, to represent our spoken word, really, or not. Okay. I like that. I think, I think bringing the architecture in was quite a, an interesting move because, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading Christopher Alexander. And in a way, I view now architecture as just the sum total of what human beings have found to be beautiful. Or, and those are maybe beyond ideas, they're ideals, but there's something interesting in bringing architecture in that uh, we could explore sometime. <laughs> Could, could, can I make one, one small point? Are you aware that all the alphabets in the world are descended from one original? No. You yes. think you could invent an <laughs> alphabet as 26 different marks, but you can't because they, the only ones that work are descended from one which comes from somewhere in Syria, somewhere in Sinai in 3000 BC. And, uh, it, and there's a table of descent in... Um, mm. Syringer, mm. which is kind of weird. So it has a, it, a, an alphabet is something alive. Oh. Here's one that we've written 2000 years before that. And I can read you some of the passages from it, although they didn't appear in any kind of written language in that alphabet. Yeah. And yet they're, they're excellent and they still exist. So no, um, but that's not written in an alphabet. It's not written in an alphabet. Yeah. So, so, so I think you're absolutely right, Andrew. I, I don't know of any counterexamples for the actual alpha beta alphabet, yes. but, um, but there's certainly written stuff that predates that, and it can well, be. Sure, there are other ways of writing, but alphabetical writing has a single origin. It does, and okay, so, I, I would have said longer than three thousand years because I'm, I'm thinking four thousand. What, what the Vedas were written three thousand nine hundred years ago, weren't they? And that was alphabetic. That was Sanskrit, was it, or or, or a root of? I'm assuming that they, that, they, that, they, that they weren't written. Maybe they were just spoken. And written later. I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly no expert in that, but, um, but um, yeah, anyway. Um, but yes, so, 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 so yes, uh, I'm perfectly willing to accept there is only one proto-alphabet and that everything has flown from that. And, and there's some very beautiful, very beautiful drawn alphabets. I've, I've seen some of these correspondences between things. It's amazing how, as language evolves as well, the alphabet also evolves and changes and is simplified, but often retains the same features between tau and t, for example, that, that look pretty much very similar. But, very but nevertheless, I think your, your earlier comment about, um, you know, that we may be skipping too quickly from, from the, the verbal origin of language to, to scripture, I, I, think, I think that's important. I mean, if we're trying to look uh, uh, to link it more to the biological uh, yeah. developmental trajectory that, 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 that John was, was, was um, kind of outlining, then I think this whole idea of, of, of tool making needs to start with uh, the older version, which is the, the oral kind of occurrence. Yeah. And, and, and if, I, if I recall correctly, some of the, the, the Russian developmental psychology or cultural historical school um, was very much into that, pointing out that it was a coordination of or tool for coordinating hunter and gatherer groups. Um, you know, it was very much looking into the, 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 the tool function of oral language in coordinating groups of humans. And I think that brings us maybe a bit closer to, to some of the stuff that, 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 that John was thinking from, I guess, because script to me is, is, is a much later occurrence. And and serves other cultural functions than, than you know, humanoids in, in small groups trying to get, get their act together, basically. Yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. picture, that picture of, of, human, of humanoids talking to one another about how to produce the flint tool that came up. Somebody mentioned the flint tool seen in the, in the stone earlier. That right. they're seeing this in the stone and they're saying, look, you have to see this in the stone and you have to press it like this. And right. as somebody who used to play with this as a kid and try and make flint tools, that's incredibly hard. You do need a teacher. You need somebody to show you how to do that. That that cultural thing, and and also in the archaeological sense, if you're looking ten, if you're looking hundred thousand years ago, some of the stuff people were making, the culture is defined in terms of the tools that they're making, it, in terms of the way that they did that flint working. All of it transmitted with that written language, of course, from generation to generation, which lasted over generations. So that process was working, and that. That flow of the language of the thinking into the tool, into the third world of Popper, is something that we've been doing for a lot longer than written language has been around. Yeah, and, 
Sorry. Sorry. I had the opportunity to watch my two granddaughters develop language real time. And I found it fascinating because they started like this string of nonsense. And as they developed language, they chopped it up like making a sausage. And I think that that's, you know, so that it's kind of like using a, it's tool making. And, and the other uh, deliverable there is that I, my understanding from a psychiatrist friend of mine is that memory only begins when you can speak. So there's yeah. an intimate relationship between speech and memory and those, that voxel, that interrelationship is vitally important, I think, to the kind of thing we're talking about. Yeah, but I think you'd need to be very, very careful here because dogs can remember things and can't speak. Uh, and, uh, and they can remember the way to places very, very well. And they can remember who you are and who's what and who beats them and who doesn't beat them to in a very, very sophisticated way. And of course, elephants, the, the ubiquitous elephant, the elephant in, uh, memorize an entire area and, and, and seasons and times that go with that area, which they then flow around. So, so although they may, be, it, it, they may be related in terms of at the same stage of development within a human, they are not exclusive to humans. That memory is not exclusive to humans, and it's not something that you require a language for. I, I don't really personally think in language very much. I'm not very good at it. Um, so most of my memories are not in language at all. They're in they're in they're in visual images. They're in pictures. They're in relationships. I am, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. Thank yeah, you. I'm trying to retrace the story here that's being told today, and it, going back from the tool to. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have symbols that we write, that we have letters, written language, and then there's the oral language. And then before that, someone said it's about abstract ideas before the language, the pre-verbal stuff. And then, yeah. the, the, and then there is the near-death experience, which, and I wonder whether there's any language there. And um, it's as though in near-death experience and abstract ideas, the five senses collapse into one another because the oral is the sound and then you have the visual with the lettering and there's possibly the tactile and, and the smell and it's there is something about the abstraction and the five senses pre before the five senses um and i'm just wondering how does whether in near death experience there was well, well, there was probably no language i don't know or just the five senses no. the five senses probably. visual but the collapse of the five senses or the coming together of the five senses. You know, it's really visual. But I hope we oh, sorry? come back. It was My experience was purely visual. I, I, had, I didn't hear, I couldn't speak. There were no other senses but the visual. There was the visual, okay. Okay. What I hope we come back to at a later date is kind of more in John's uh, domain and that is how a neural net what is it fundamentally a neural net? What is the mark in a neural net? You know, what, what's, what is the mechanism by which a distinction occurs? Because to me, that's closer to what I think I may mean by um, an idea. For me, an idea is a feeling and everything after that gets uh, you hunt for. So I don't know, I, I, I think you know, I think going back to neural nets would be an interesting conversation. Yes. Uh, neural nets uh, for me in the terms of cellular communication. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, for, for actually what we've been talking about, how, how is it that a brain, not just any neural net, but uh, I mean, you could simulate it on a computer, but how, how is it, what shows up first? Because in a way we've been trying to, seems to me trying to say what's what's the first mark what's the first distinction in language and for me it's almost got to be a, a product of a neural net this is this is Damasio's territory isn't it i i i, I find this a very interesting <clears throat> line, line as well in in theory of learning as as humans put their brain together we, we, we're taught that um that the kind of distinction that, that humans make falls into several major categories to begin with. And then people tend to think on those. And these categories are, uh, one of them is language. Well, another one is the visual category. Another one is analogies. This is like this, but different. Another one is, is tactile, is experience. How does this hands-on experience of, uh, of things? And that people tend to start 
as very, very small humans by latching on to one or other of those. And that then tends to drive the development of the later way that they think and understand the world around them in terms of the deepest way in which they understand complex subjects, either visual or logical language or analogic or um, hands-on, tactile. Do an example, give me an example. So, so I'm fascinated by how neural networks then kind of create themselves. So if the conversation at some stage went in that direction, I'd be very, very interested to learn something about that. So, um, so mm. if anyone's got anything, perhaps in this group that's already been well talked about. I, I, sure. I, I think this is heading in the direction that I w would be useful in the sense that the connection usually when philosophers and psychologists and everybody else talks about language, they stay at the level of language when they're talking about language. Yeah. And to make the connection to a deeper substrate, a biological substrate, the mechanisms within the biological substrate, which is then producing the language, that seems important. Yeah. Oh, so uh, sorry, Mark, that, that, that was a bit where I was driving at is like, the question is, do we see the occurrence of, you know, oral language as an in, inevitable kind of step? I mean, do you, if you bring a group of humanoids together and it reaches a certain complexity in terms of, you know, action goals, do we need something like oral language? Because, you know, tactile and other stuff just wouldn't do it. A group and, of oh, deaf why, did, oh, why, did, why doesn't why does not a telepathic kind of interface occur? Yeah? Why didn't that occur in the... In the, in the How evolution? do you know that it hasn't? <laughs> right? How do you know that it hasn't? <laughs> no, of course, we have yeah, a developed it. I, I mean, it you is. and me, of course. I mean, that, that's not... Well, I think empathic, empathic, uh, you know, uh, definitely, I think there's enough science to say that people get in synchrony em empathically, right? Um, I don't know if they do it. I don't think share thoughts, but boy, feelings are transmitted um, non-verbally. And we get in sync with, uh, with others. Uh, there's a name for that. I can't bring it to mind. Yeah, but does it work to give instructions to whole groups? You know, does it work as, an, as, an, as, a, as a means of giving instructions to say, like, you three go over there, you three, you know, walk up the hill and wait for that mammal to show up or stuff like that? S sign so, language. Sign language works. Yes. So, so deaf humans have no language. They, yeah. Imagine humanoids who can't hear, can't speak. Perfectly mm -hmm. simple. But they yeah. can see. And I think it does give instructions, just not the ones you're pointing out. It says, be aware, be wary, or relax, yeah. sleep. I mean, it gives pretty important instruction. John. Oh, I was, yeah, I mean, in an absolutely totally reductionist sense, I mean, if the epigenetic mechanism is one in which our endocrine system is really what dictates our behavior, and that in turn is the underpinnings of the way that I would submit I'd have to dig into the literature, but that's how neural networks form through endocrine and neuroendocrine uh, integration of neuronal uh, transduction. Yeah. So, um, and, and again, that's, that doesn't address Seb's just comment just now about the group, but certainly, I mean, we know that pheromones, for example, do synchronize, you know, it's like women in a, in a sorority house, they all start to menstruate in, in, you know, in sync with one another because of pheromones. And that's just one ex example, there are many. So yeah, so I mean, if you reduce this to the endocrine system and how that dictates behavior and therefore verbalization, then, then that goes from a very basic biologic set of principles to the oral transmission and then, yeah. So, so this is very interesting because this is then starting to sort of edge on to this issue of education because um, that close relationship of, um, I don't know, uh, women in college or whatever it might be, um, monasteries are interesting, uh, families obviously, in settings like that where there's very high, degree, high degrees of stress, you're going to see differences in the way that the neural networks form and you're going to see differences in the communications that are uttered. And very often that, that can become a horrible positive feedback mechanism and all sorts of nasty things. And we see, God damn it, we see this at a national level. We see nations um, behaving like this. Yeah, I mean, that, the whole thing with trauma, you know, in the, uh, you know, adverse childhood events. And uh, in that first thousand days, if people live in 
pr pretty much a saturated adrenergic uh, fight or flight response. They have very different brains, very different neurological. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, 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 the work around this has kind of centered, I mean, John Bowlby has been very important. The whole sort of attachment theory uh, thing has been very important. The child's relationship with the primary caregiver, usually the mother. And, um, and there's plenty of evidence that damage to attachments early in life really screws you up later on. Um, I've noticed that over the last uh, five or six years, there's been quite a lot of work around epigenetics and attachment, uh, which looks very interesting. And I th this is the thing that really uh, has, has got me thinking, because it's almost as if the, this making the connection between the cellular dynamics, the cellular organization level and the linguistic level, making that connection gives us two descriptions of the same thing. That's very powerful. When we get two descriptions of the same thing, that's much more interesting than just looking at language through the lens of language, which was, you know, you're always going to get stuck there somehow. Yeah, it becomes teleologic. Yes, that's right. As far as the networks go, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, in organizations now, um, it's no longer brainstorming, it's collective intelligence and it's organizing people as a flock of birds would. And that's through intuition or telepathy or all the stuff that we've been talking about. And I'm sure that goes back down to the cellular level. There's something You're that doing is some of this stuff, aren't you, Vinka? Well, I am, yes. I mean, I'm teaching leadership and using meditation and using yoga and using collective intelligent processes. I'm doing it, you know, I'm applying it. And it's very powerful. I mean, it, it gets my students to connect at, at, a, at a very powerful level. Uh, and this transformations, um, consciousness, understanding, it, it, it has a huge impact on the education process. See, we, we need to study this. I really think there's, there's a need for more empirical work at the level of communication. And if we can look at a, a deeper biological level, oh, sorry, I've got a very optimistic ice cream man again. It's always time to this time. <laughs> it still exists. It's so miserable outside. You'd know, ice cream would be the last thing you think about. <laughs> it's a reflex. No, but going back to what Andrew was saying about fonts, um, I don't know if everyone's aware of the fact that Steve Jobs was fascinated with fonts. It was really mm. his avocation. He, he worked very diligently to form fonts for Apple computers that he thought would be most effective. But the reason I bring it back to that is because, I know, I mean, I've, maybe it's just an idiosyncratic thing of mine, but if I don't see my font as Times New Roman, it looks goofy to me. If, I, if it lapses into Cambrian or whatever that other stuff is that you know, they wing it every once in a while. So in terms of what Vink is saying, even huddled around a computer and having that kind of integration of thought through the modality of the font that you use and the form that you use, I think is probably um, productive in terms of uh, mass education, right? Getting everybody literally on the same page. Right. Mm. What about the scriptoria in the monasteries? Hmm. Okay. Everyone yeah. writes the same thing. Yeah. They were, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to mention that uh, I heard this fascinating lecture. This guy never published this damn paper. He's um, anyway. I, I won't. But 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 he he was um, he had measured oxytocin in people in prayer. And he showed that the oxytocin levels go up when people are joined together in prayer. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, there are other people who have shown similar kinds of phenomena. But so I'm, I'm going back to my endocrine modality. Well, I think we should study ourselves. I don't know what the practicalities of measuring these, um, these, these, these hormones are, but I'm very interested in it feels different. It feels different to have this kind of conversation online than every other bloody conversation I have been <laughs> during the week. And I'm sure I'm not, comp I don't think there's anybody who's stressed. There's, there's plenty of, uh, the, you plenty have to spit in the tube, man. I, I'm an endocrinologist by training, so I know this stuff. Mm. And yeah. I think I've mentioned that I, I'm trying to get a public paper published on subjective age, which I goes to what I'm, we're talking about. The fact that we perceive ourselves as being older when we're teenagers and, and younger when we're old folks like me. 
that's un the underpinning of that is endocrinology. And so I go back to my premise that that's what's cre creating behaviors that then create the kinds of phenomena and epiphenomena that we're talking about at a certain level. I mean, it, it's tending to force it a bit, but I don't think totally. I think it does, that does sort of create the nuancing that we're talking about. There's quite a bit of research on uh, the, the cellular or the effects, the uh, hormonal effects and other effects uh, of meditation mm. are on human beings. Yep. Uh, yeah. I've, I've been, you know, reading up on that, and the, the, it, the, that those connections, those that those, those studies of that, which uh, tie in, I think tie into our discussion. Yeah, uh, the, the, thing the, the thing that's interesting there is that, at least in my reduction of that, the the, the binary of stress versus meditation is they are actually mirror images. But that what happens is you go as you meditate and you become more and more effective at doing that, you go back to the gut brain. You, you, you de-evolve de from the brain brain to the gut brain, which is much less neurotic. And that's why we find it pleasant to be in that state of being. Sorry, I probably- The gut somebody. brain. Yeah, that's where the brain brain evolved from. So the gut produces hormones like leptin and ghrelin, which are actually cause the bushiness of our brains. But that's where it emanates from. In quadrupeds, it's much more gut brain than it is uh, you know, the central nervous system that we, we experience. I don't always trust my guts, though. Well, but you know, they say that if, like, you're, if you're taking a, you know, a competitive test like an SAT or whatever, yeah. you should go with your gut. It's probably the right answer. And that actually does work. Mm. It, it wow. circumvents the neuroses of our, you know, uh, our egos and super egos getting yes, in the yes, way. Yes, I can see that. Getting in the way of thinking. Hang on, what are you saying? Is that the gut brain is a real thing? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Where is it in the body? In your gut. In your gut. It's where, the, it's where your microbiome talks to your bi to your biome. That's what the microbiome is doing. The so I have a distributed intelligence. It's not in here. It's throughout my whole body. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's my take home message. Physiology is it goes all the way from the unicellular state up and everything in between. We just don't think about it and we're not aware of it. But it does come back. Um, it does exhibit itself under you know, like Mas uh, Abraham Maslow's peak experiences. That's what those yeah. are. It's the co it's being conscious of our being, you know, it mind is a what do you want to call it? Yeah. There's a different sensibility than um, your other senses in your brain. And while it shouldn't, uh, it doesn't have the nuance of, uh, of your brain, it certainly should never be ignored. As my Aikido sensei pointed out that fear, which is a gut kind of, uh, brain piece is uh is telling you you're not organized for what's happening it's it's not and, and boy that's really useful information it doesn't tell you what to do it pretty much tells you to reconsider right i would distinguish between guts or rather between instinct and intuition an instinct is much more reptilian and intuition is something that is much closer to actual consciousness, a fuller consciousness of what's going on, which where gut is fear and intuition will take you somewhere else. And it would allow you to make exactly the right decision with some foresight, which is not reflected upon in any mental capacity. I don't know if I got it right when I was reading Bohm 20, 30 years ago, but so the, what I did walk away with was you have a bunch of warring parts of your brain that are all more than willing to lie to you. Yeah. And, and I think that's what you're pointing out. There is a, a space uh, to watch the liars and decide which one you're going to listen to. Yeah. We, we've been, been going uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, what is interesting, the time flies by, doesn't it? Um, I, I want to draw back to the idea of nil potency, if I may, and just try and revisit kind of where we started, which uh, in a sense, we've got a cellular, a cellular mechanism described by John, which seems to be, have some strong resemblance to Peter's nilpotent quantum mechanics in the way that it operates and 
in a sense, we may be looking at some of these language phenomena, which may also have a similar structure. And the opportunity, perhaps, is to start to look at language in this nilpotent, uh, through this nilpotent lens, but to look at it both at the linguistic level and at a biological level. Is, is that, I, th I think, first of all, to, to John, is, is that, how you see a potential way forwards and Peter is this crazy so I posted my I'm, I'm writing a paper trying to write a paper on, on the evolution of language based upon cellular cooperativity which I think initially sounds like you know it sounds trivial but it's not because it I, I, I mapped it out in a way where I can go step by step you know, not totally to which I satisfaction I haven't filled in all the gaps but but there is a stepwise relationship between the evolution of language as cellular communication mm -hmm. all the way up to the formation of language in, you know, dictated by the area of Broca and everything in between with some gaps because we're not thinking that way. I mean, the, the literature on the evolution of language is all about, it's synchronic, it's, it's descriptive, it's teleologic, it's not getting us anywhere. It's it just mm -hmm. dead ends. Whereas I think that this way of thinking about um, language in relationship to the unicell and the unicell in relationship to the atom forms a continuum which actually has a logic to it with a lot of empiric evidence to support it. Mm. So, I mean, Peter, you've, I mean, you, you're, you've got your mechanism in uh, Nilpotent and quantum mechanics. Clearly, there seems to be a relationship between that mechanism and the work that, that John's doing, which is why, kind of why we're here. Yeah, the, um, I mean, literally? <laughs> well, no, 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 not literally why we're here, but it's why, why, why we're sort of having these uh, oh, yeah. sort of rewarding oh, conversations in a way. I was reading too deeply into that. Oh, I know. <laughs> but, but actually, you could be right. <laughs> and the ice cream man is going to come around again tomorrow as well for the same reason. So, and anything that can be expressed as a conservation energy system mm. in some way can always be expressed as a null potent. Mm. It's possible to do mathematically. There's no question about that. And so if you're able to do that, and if you're able to bring concepts like entropy and so on into it, that, that mm. is what null potent systems do. Mm. And so ultimately one can do something like this um, in that way. And you ask if it's crazy, well, I guess it is. But if it isn't crazy, it's not worth talking about. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, just so I can comment on that, I think that's a great point because uh, I've gone on record to say that um, all aspects of the totality, whether it's physics, chemistry, or biology, are in balanced equations set off by an equal sign, which is the homeostatic result of you know the, the Big Bang, the third law of emotion. But I could think of a, a sentence in the same way. You know subject plus verb equals object right it's the same if there is balance there there is no potence there if, if you if you parse it out that way so my next question then is is this reductionist because some people will look at our discussions and say oh but the the beauty of life the be you're kind of trying to take out the soul of things and personally i see it quite the opposite but it, it is that a criticism that we need to take to, to take seriously No, I, I don't think so. I think we, uh, but our job is to be reductionist, and so there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. That's the, what a scientist's job is, is to be reductionist, and then to build it up together again. And it doesn't mean that we can't appreciate from other points of view. Of course we can. Yeah. But there's something about that, science there, isn't there? But I think that, you know, in that context of reductionist versus holist approaches, that at least in biology, the issue is always the emergent property of biology. And, yes. and people address that as, you know, self-organizing, organizing, self-referential, self-authorship. But in my way of putting things back together, the, the importance of memory um, in terms of um, being able to conjure up strategies that have been used in the history of the organism to now deal with an existential problem that's where emergence comes from. So my point being that, yes, it's reductionist, but it's not leaving all the pieces of the puzzle on the table and not assembling them. Now you can reassemble them in a way where you can actually understand in a holistic way 
why that missing piece is missing because it is, uh, it's a gestalt, it's, it's, an, it's an integration of the process. Right, I, I think that's, that's very powerful. Um, I've got a question about memory, but I'm wondering if we should leave memory until next week, if we remember. You will, you will forget. I won't, I won't, actually I'm forgetting everything at the moment. <laughs> I wonder, I, I suppose, I wonder if memory and anticipation are very closely connected. Yes. And, and anticipation is so important in terms of the way we organize ourselves effectively in our environment. And what's the difference between anticipation and prediction? Uh, well, no, they would say they're the same. They are? I yeah. wouldn't. You wouldn't? Yeah, there's a hierarchy there. I mean, prediction is a certain, is, is a certainty, whereas, well, as best we know, but anticipation is kind well, of- Okay, yes, you working. can make it, yes, all right. We're uh, talking about a system being anticipatory, not, you know, us anticipating so much. Yes, yeah. a, a system being anticipatory, yes. That, that's not the same thing as, uh, as prediction. Hmm. I mean, you, we can use it for prediction. If we know a system's anticipatory, we can use it for prediction. Hmm. Prediction would be epistemological, and anticipation hmm. would be the ontological. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, yeah. So, well, maybe we could pick this up next week. Yep. Anybody got any last questions before we meet again? I will send the video around to everybody. Um, it's, I've, I've, again, I've really enjoyed it this week. So thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. you. So Mark, I just got a visual on anticipation. You remember that Carly Simon song? Anticipation mm -hmm. with a ketchup? <laughs> the ketchup oh. bottle, and she's waiting for it to come out of the bottle. So what? Yeah. We're anticipating it's going to come out of the bottle, but we predicted it's going to hit the bun or the hot dog. Or yes. The okay. Dog. Yeah. Yes. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay well, well, thank you ever so much, everybody, and um, yeah, see you next week. Yeah. Okay. See you next week. Mark. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.